I just get the honor before we hear the scripture and our uh, guest preacher comes up, I get to introduce him. And I'll do the formal part of the introducing, which is that Reverend Nathan Day Wilson directs institutional and program planning, staff development, evaluation, reporting, and fundraising for the World Council of Churches, which is a global fellowship of 352 denominations comprised of 580 million people in over 120 countries. Can we get an amen? amen. He's kind of a big deal. He also has experience in congregational, academic, non-governmental, and ecumenical uh, settings. And we're so delighted to have him here this morning. I know many of you are here because Nathan has been significant and important in your life. And we're so glad that you're with us. Um, and here's the part where I say why well, he's significant to me. Uh, Nathan and I were in the first cohort of the Wabash Pastoral Leadership Program that started 14 years ago, uh, and the friendship continues to this day, so I'm honored to have him here. But more than that, I'm honored that he is my friend, and we have been to the mountaintop, and he has walked in the valley with me, and all of you know how important that is. So let's prepare our hearts and minds to hear the good news from the scripture. I'll be reading today from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. May the Lord have his blessing on this reading. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before you start the clock on my sermon, <laughs> don't pretend like you weren't going to do that. <laughs> I'm getting a little feedback here. Um, should I move one direction? Um, I'm going to say one thing. Um, First Christian Church in Louisville. I give great thanks for this congregation. When I think of First Christian Church Louisville, I think of names like Stauffer that you may have heard, right? I think of issues such as busing in Louisville and Jefferson County, public education, uh, the times when you have stood for the dignity and well-being of all of God's children. And I think of commitments such as your long-standing commitment to Kumbaya, Camp Kumbaya, 
and your excellence with ministry, with children, youth, and young adults. So I give thanks for First Christian in Louisville. But wait, as any infomercial will tell you, there's more. <laughs> Not only do I give thanks for your past, for your history, I also give thanks for your present and your future. And for that, I mainly refer to your clergy. I know Amanda, as you've heard, quite well. I know Meredith, a.k.a. Muffy, well. I even, most of the time, will admit to knowing Tommy Cook. Who actually, I've known longer. And then Jerry and I go back almost 10 minutes now. To, uh, and uh, when we talk about ministerial uh, competency, we usually talk about that in kind of three different categories. We talk about theological depth, ability to think theologically, not just politically or sociologically or even anthropologically. We talk about skills like uh, church administration, worship leadership, communication, uh, pastoral care. And we talk about the ability to analyze social issues. Those of you who are part of this church are very fortunate because you have clergy who have all three sets of competencies. And while it's not necessarily a part of my tradition normally, can I get an amen to that? <laughs> so I give thanks for your work, your words, your witness, and for the future of this church. You can start the clock now if you want. <laughs> so you've probably heard this one about the little girl in the thunderstorm, right? Uh, thunder and lightning's coming down. Parents are concerned about her, how she might be doing, and so they go to her room to check on her, and when they see her in, the, in her room, she has her face pressed against the window. And they say, honey, are, are, are you okay? Are you, are you scared? Is, and she said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And why do you have your face pressed against the window? And she says, well, obviously. <laughs> you all know four-year-old girls. <laughs> obviously. God is trying to take a picture of me, and so I wanted to give God a better view. <laughs> God is trying to take a picture of me. I don't know if you've noticed, but someone got the life cycle backwards. Did you notice that? I mean, you should die first. Just get that out of the way, right? After that, then, and now we call it retirement, you can live for a certain number of years where, uh, I'm told at least, you're busy, but you don't have as, lot, as many pressures, right? After you finish that, when you are ready to move on, then you can go to work, where I can tell you for a fact you're both busy and you have a lot of pressure, right? <laughs> work inside the home, work outside the home, raising, a child, raising children, the most difficult work, maybe all of the above. After a period of that, you go on. Four years, for some of us, eight years or ten years or more of partying, I mean, I mean studying. <laughs> Let the record show, uh, that's a nod to dairy girls, let the record show that I said studying, not partying, all you teenagers. And then once you're finished with that period of life, you can graduate to high school. Because we all know what happens in high school. That's when you know all the answers to all the questions. And now you're ready. Middle school, elementary school, you're becoming more of a child, more time to play, fewer responsibilities. Then you spend nine months floating, 100% dependent on your mother, and you end as the gleam in somebody's eye. Now tell me that's not a better plan. Hmm? The gleam, <laughs> thank you, thank you, I'll, I'll work on that. The gleam in somebody's eye. So Amanda mentioned I work at the World Council of Churches, and occasionally I give tours of the World Council. I'm not the best person to do so. There are others who I think do a better job. But sometimes there are certain groups that it makes sense for me to give uh, tours to. Uh, for instance, not too long ago, I gave a tour to a group of representatives from the German Foreign Ministry um, in Berlin. And so I tell them, as I'll tell you, which is the question that I suspect was on your mind when you came into the sanctuary this morning, I wonder what room at the World Council is Nathan's favorite room. Is that what you were thinking about when you... Well, my favorite room at the World Council is the chapel. And it's not only my favorite room because I'm a better Christian than you are, it's also <laughs> my favorite room. 
I mean, that's just a part of it. It's also my favorite room because of some of the distinctive parts of the chapel. For example, I'll give you three of those. The walls of the chapel are made of wood that comes from Indonesia. And the wood is a gift of the government of Indonesia, not the churches in Indonesia, because of the World Council of Churches' work on interreligious dialogue in that country, which you probably know is very important, interreligious dialogue and cooperation. And the walls are extremely thin. Most churches have thick walls. European cathedrals have very thick walls. Our walls are extremely thin. That's on purpose so that when you are in the chapel, when we gather for prayers at 8.30 each morning, and when you're in the chapel and the wind blows, you know the wind is blowing. You know you're a part of the larger creation. It's very intentional. Second thing I like is the ceiling of the chapel is made in the shape of waves. A Dutch designer is the one who designed it. And the idea behind that is to emphasize that being a person of faith is an ongoing voyage. It's not one and done, like Kentucky basketball. It is an ongoing (laughs) voyage, right? So that you are faced daily, even more than daily, hourly in some cases, with choices, decisions. Uh, opportunities or obstacles. And being a person of faith is making those decisions in an ongoing way. A third thing, I'll I'll stop with three. You Christians seem to like the number three, so I'll stop there. If you're at the altar, to the right is a cross. It's one of seven in the chapel, but it's the only one that's made of metal. And it comes from the metal that was in the wall dividing East Germany from West Germany, communism from democracy. And when the wall came down, 1989, 1990, 1991, the churches on both sides gathered the metal and had it melted into the shape of a cross, gave that to the World Council of Churches as a cross of reconciliation because the World Council insisted, as we still do, on keeping at the table people from churches regardless of the socio-political makeup. Communist churches churches from uh, democratic countries, keeping them at the table during the Cold War. Translate that to now, when we get so much pressure to expel the Russian Orthodox Church, that will not happen, because we want to keep dialogue open, keep dialogue possible by keeping people at the table. So, I was giving this tour to the group from the foreign ministry uh, of Germany, and I just, you know, was kind of in autopilot, and going through all the different gifts and so forth, got to the cross, gave that little bit of history about the cross, and one of the members afterwards, one of the diplomats, walked up to the cross, and she read the plaque, which is at the base of the cross, and it's written in German. Surprise, I don't speak or read German. (laughs) She came back to me, and she said, you know, this cross that you're calling cross of reconciliation, she said, "That's, that's correct but it also could be cross of transformation. I was about to say something like I would say, which is like, you know, yeah, of course I knew that. (laughs) But thankfully, she beat me to the punch, and she said, after all, reconciliation always requires transformation. I said, thank you very much. (laughs) That'll preach. I love this passage from Luke, Road to Emmaus. Is it familiar to you? If it is, listen to it even more closely, of course. Cleopas and his friend, unnamed friend. That gives you an opportunity. Who is the friend? Well, it could be another disciple. That's a likely guess. It could be one of the women who was every bit as faithful as any of the men, but never get named, right? Or you can apply the midrash idea that comes from Judaism where rabbis would fill in the gap in the story with something else. Now, you can't say it was Cleopas and an astronaut. That doesn't fit, (laughs) right? But you could say Cleopas and one of us also a follower of Jesus. So Cleopas and his friend in the Act 1, the first part of the story, are fleeing Jerusalem. 
Do you remember what's just happened? Jesus has just been put to death. This, this person, this itinerant preacher that they followed for three or so years of their life, in many cases leaving jobs, some cases leaving families, upending their world completely to, give all, to be all in, is dead. And it's three days later, and he's still as dead as he was, they thought, three days before. Imagine the grief that they must have been feeling. The, the emotions of being disheartened, of bewilderment, of anger, of emotions so strong that they are fleeing Jerusalem. Not walking, running. They are ready to get away from everything they've known and has been such a massive disappointment. Act 2. Part of the reason I like this story is it's a clear three-part structure. (laughs) Act 2. Here comes Jesus incognito. Right? The undercover boss, Jesus. (laughs) Basically. (laughs) And starts with... uh, Come on, Jesus, I think you could have had a little better opening here. (laughs) What are y'all upset about? (laughs) Seriously? (laughs) Under what rock uh, have you been? What have you not caught on to what's been happening here? And they tell him, from their perspective, what has happened. And he transforms them through the dialogue. And then act three the part that we oftentimes forget, they return. They go back to the possibility of reconciled, of restored community. So not only do I like the nice three-part structure, I think this story might have some things to tell us today. For example, since you asked, for example, (laughs) being a follower of Jesus being one literally on the road to following Jesus might be less about having all the right answers to all the questions and more about being open to others' interpretations. Cleopas and his friend, everything's correct that they have to say, but it's just limited by their frames of reference. They don't say anything off base or or incorrect, or um, untrue. But it is limited by how they have viewed the events, and then Jesus broadens their views of the events. He begins to fill in these gaps to lead to their transformation. Another thing this passage might have to tell us is the importance of Scripture and of communion. The Eucharist that we will celebrate uh, in a few minutes. But notice, even more fundamental than that is the importance of hospitality. If Cleopas and his friend had not welcomed Jesus back to be with them, their eyes would not have been opened, their hearts would not have burned, those powerful words, that transformation would not have taken root, and then they would not have said, which... It's a little bit weird. You could, you could actually uh, parse this a couple different ways. Oh, well, Simon says he's risen, so he must have. Despite the fact they've already admitted that some women had told them that prior to this, right? But without that hospitality, their hearts would never have been opened. I've heard it said before that the two core virtues in all three of the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the two core virtues are compassion and hospitality. Compassion for those who cannot or do not deserve your compassion. For those who are unlike you. For the stranger, which by definition is one who is strange to you. And hospitality for those who likewise could not return it. It's not a quid pro quo where I invite you to my party so that you'll invite me to your party. It's hospitality even though you ain't got a party. Right? 
Those are the two core virtues that all three of the Abrahamic traditions share and some other world and spiritual traditions as well in their best form. Now, I don't know about you, but I think these are pretty topsy-turvy times in the world. Just a little bit turbulent. We thought we were coming out of the pandemic and things would, what do you say, return to normal? But then we realized we didn't know what normal was. And then we had a war, not the only war, many other wars also going on before and still, but a war that was completely unexpected. And now we still have other geopolitical instability. And so when I read a passage like this or any other passage that is similar in its kind of mind expanding, taking me out of my frame of reference, I'm looking for those ways, those lessons that might work for me living in this very unstable time. And here are, I think, a few. Maybe be open, all of us, to the presence of Jesus in those places and in those people where we least expect it. You can name those, think of those for yourself. The the presence of Jesus in those places and those people where we would least expect to see it being open to his presence. Maybe a lesson such as being transformed through how we walk and talk about not just the absence of Jesus, but the the power of his presence. I have heard it said, uh, one of my favorite people to quote has said this and written it, Change is difficult, but stagnation is fatal. Did you catch that? Change is difficult, but stagnation is fatal. Do you like that quote? Yeah, it's mine. (laughs) I never said humility was at the top of my list, but someone else has also said something similar. Uh, her name's Octavia Butler. Do you know, are you familiar with Octavia Butler? Mm-hmm. Yeah. African-American science fiction writer. Absolutely fabulous. If you have a chance, and you do, uh, read three of her books, Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, and Kindred. And that's the order that I recommend them. Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents and Kindred. Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents were two in what was uh, intended to be a trilogy. She died before the third book, uh, before she wrote the third book. In Parable of the Sower, she writes this. Everything you touch, you change. Everything you change, changes you. God is change. She wrote uh, Parable of the Sower, by the way, this is free of charge, in 1993. The events take place in 2024. It is uncanny how on point she is. A fourth lesson. Be ready to welcome the stranger. Now, I want to kind of bear down on this one for just a second. I have the microphone and you don't, so I get to do that. (laughs) Welcoming the stranger, hospitality, is not only something you do altruistically. It's not only something you selflessly do to help another. According to the Bible, hospitality, welcoming the stranger, those who are strange to you, is intrinsically important for your own spiritual health. It's not just something you do to help another it is important for your own spiritual health. Be open, be ready to welcome the stranger, those who you think are strange. And the last lesson, never stop longing. Let us never stop longing for the day when all of Christ's children can celebrate the Eucharist together. 
We're blessed this morning that we have with us uh, members of the United Church of Canada, the Presbyterian Church, the United Methodist Church, Church, and also the Episcopal Church. And I may have missed others. It's all good friends. Thank you for being here. We long for that day. Let us never stop longing for that day when we can celebrate the Eucharist together. One last thing about this passage that you probably have already figured out. Being a follower of Christ, being a part of the body of Christ, is inherently communal. Did you catch that? Cleopas and his friend, whoever the friend was, did not have this transforma- uh, transformational experience and then go off on their own. They didn't go start a new church. They didn't get bracelets that said, what would Jesus do? They didn't start talking about me and Jesus. They go back to the community in the hope of restored community. Being a part of the church, being a a Christian, is inherently communal. I'm not saying this is the case, but it could be the case that I don't like you very much, or you like me. But if we both claim Christ as our Savior, we are a part of the same community. I, uh, I love the Olympics. Love the Summer Olympics. Love the Winter Olympics. I know the Olympics have problems and they're hopefully addressing. I love individual events. I love team events. Uh, I love the, the events that I understand, the sports I understand, which are most of them. Uh, I love the few that I'm not so sure about as well. I'm even willing to call curling a sport. <laughs> now. I, it took me a while to get there. <laughs> Yeah, amen. I also love the Special Olympics. And uh, some years ago, it's been a minute now, Janice and I were watching the Special Olympics at, you're welcome, Bob, it's the Ohio State University. (laughs) uh, Parentheses. Any school that has to insist on a definite article before its name... (laughs) I'm just putting that out there. So we were there at the, uh, at the Horseshoe, which is quite an impressive stadium. And it was time for the 100-meter dash, Special Olympics. The eight athletes lined up, and uh, the gun sounded, and the race started. Now, one thing that's different about the athletes and the events at the Special Olympics, uh, as compared to uh, the Olympics, is that you can watch the events really unfold. There's, there's time, there's opportunity to really watch the event unfold. So the gun sounds. And within two or three strides, you could tell. At a clear number one, number two, number three were about neck and neck, and then number four, and then everyone else. So you knew how this was going to unfold. Another stride, another couple of strides. And the man in fourth place begins to stumble. The woman in first place, uh, who appeared to us to uh, be Down syndrome, after another stride or two, starts to notice that the guy in fourth is starting to fall. He falls, skins his knee, his elbow, starts crying. (sighs) Sucked. And the woman in first place starts slowing down, looking over his shoulder, hearing him crying, and she comes to a stop. When she stops, number two and number three stop. Everybody else stops. She goes back to the man who's on the track. Knee is bloody, his elbow's bloody, crying very loud. You could hear a pin drop, except for his crying. And she bends down and she says, it's okay. It's okay. You're okay. You're okay. And she helps him up. The others kind of gather around and uh, we're all <laughs> crying. And, uh, and then they all hold hands. And all eight athletes walk across the finish line together. Amen. 
That's the church at its best. In this thing that we call the race of life, we're not competing with each other. We should be collaborating with each other, hand in hand, helping each other up, um, consoling each other when we need consolation, celebrating with each other when there are opportunities to celebrate, realizing that each of us and all of us are gleams in God's eye. God is wanting to take our picture if we would just give God a better view. 